Good morning, afternoon, evening, night, whenever you're watching this, welcome back to the Mr. Sin channel. Today we are going to review motivation as we continue to explore Unit 4 of AP Psychology. Alright, so let's be real. Why do you get out of bed in the morning? Is it because you're excited to go to school to learn? Is it because you are ready to crank some 90s in Fortnite? Or is it because you're excited to hang out with your friends? Regardless of the reason, we can see that motivation is what pushes us to take action. It is what helps us study for a test, prepare for that big game, or sit on the couch for hours watching TikTok. Motivation consists of biological, emotional, social, and cognitive forces, all of which influence an individual to take action. Generally, we can see that people are motivated to fulfill their primary or secondary needs. Primary needs include basic biological needs, such as food, water, or sleep. These needs are innate and must be met to maintain a person's well-being. Secondary needs, on the other hand, are psychological needs that help with a person's well-being and social fulfillment. For instance, social approval, love, and a sense of belonging. Now, both humans and animals are motivated for different reasons. Non-human animals often rely on instincts, which are fixed patterns of behavior that automatically kick in when an animal encounters certain stimuli. Whereas human behaviors and mental processes processes are generally more complex, not just relying on instinctual responses. When trying to better understand why people do what they do, we can look at a variety of different theories on motivation, such as the drive reduction theory which states that behavior is often driven by the need for an individual to maintain homeostasis. Remember, homeostasis is the body's way of keeping everything inside your body balanced, such as your temperature or energy levels. This theory highlights how a person's internal states motivate them to act focusing on behavior and mental processes. For example, say an individual does not have enough calories, creating an imbalance in their body. This imbalance ends up triggering the individual to feel hungry, which then motivates the individual to eat, ultimately restoring their body back to homeostasis. Notice how the imbalance in the individual's body influenced the individual's behaviors and actions. The motivation here was to try and get the body back to a balanced state. Now, hunger and the process of eating are actually a great example of how our mind and body work together to drive behavior. On the physical side, our bodies rely on hormones such as ghrelin and leptin and brain regions such as the hypothalamus to regulate our hunger and satiety, while our thoughts, environment, and culture influence how and what we choose to eat. When your stomach is empty, your ghrelin levels will start to increase. Ghrelin is known as the hunger hormone since it signals to the brain that your body needs energy. When your ghrelin levels levels rise, it stimulates the hypothalamus through the pituitary gland to increase your appetite, ultimately motivating you to eat. And as you eat, we can see that your ghrelin levels will then start to decrease, thus reducing the desire to eat as well. Now, leptin, also known as the satiety hormone, is another hormone that plays a role in our motivation to eat. Leptin is produced by fat cells. As leptin levels increase, the hypothalamus registers that you are full, which then reduces your motivation to eat. Just think of ghrelin as that voice in your stomach yelling, food now, and leptin as that chill friend who's like, it's okay, dude, we're good. Put the pizza down. One thing to notice with both of these hormones is the role of the hypothalamus. Remember, the hypothalamus is located in the brain and it processes signals from hormones to help the body. It works with the pituitary gland, which releases hormones that influence our bodily functions. Now, it isn't just biological factors that motivate a person to eat. We can look at external factors as well. For instance, even if a person's leptin levels are high, if they see their favorite dessert, they might be tempted to eat, even if they're technically full. The mere presence or smell of food can motivate a person to eat, even if they do not need more calories. The time of day also impacts when a person eats. People like routine and if they get used to eating during a particular time of the day, it's common that they will become hungry during those times. Plus, we haven't even talked about how a person's culture impacts a person and their food. For instance, think about how you celebrate holidays, accomplishments, life milestones, and birthdays. I would bet that food is a major part of it. Now, if you do need more help with the drive reduction theory, instincts, or motivation and eating, you can take the practice quiz that I created for you in the ultimate review packet. Just click 
click the link down below once you're done with this video. Another theory of motivation that we need to review is the arousal theory, which focuses on how a person's motivation is impacted by the amount of stimulation they are experiencing. The arousal theory states that people are motivated to maintain an optimal level of arousal. This theory shows that everyone has a preferred level of alertness. Too little stimulation leads an individual to experience boredom, while too much can lead to stress, which may result in the individual to feel frozen in place. Individuals will change their actions to either try and increase or decrease their arousal. The goal here is to stay in that optimal spot. The arousal theory is based on the yerkson dotson law, which is the principle that performance increases with arousal, but only up to a certain point. If an individual goes beyond that point, their performance will start to decrease. Here you can see this graphically. On the y-axis, we have an individual's performance level, and on the x-axis is the arousal level. Notice that if we compare difficult tasks and easy tasks, that it takes less stimulation to do better on difficult tasks, showing that the difficulty of the task does play a role in an individual's performance. So we can see that individuals are constantly evaluating their situations and adjusting their behaviors to reflect their arousal level, with the goal being to find the optimal arousal level, where their performance is best. For example, a slight amount of stress before a test can help motivate you to study and help you focus, but an excessive amount of stress and anxiety can cause you to freeze, resulting in you studying less and doing worse on the test. So we can see that motivation is complex. Sometimes it comes from external factors, and sometimes it comes from within. One theory that looks at both both internal and external factors is the self-determination theory, which states that people can be motivated by intrinsic or extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation comes from within, for example, enjoyment or personal satisfaction, while extrinsic motivation comes from outside, for instance, rewards or avoiding punishments. For example, studying because you generally love psychology is intrinsic, but studying because your parents said no more cell phone until your grades improved proof, well, that's extrinsic. Now, the self-determination theory focuses on how people are naturally inclined to grow and develop. This happens when a person feels a sense of control over their actions, feels capable of achieving their goals, and feels connected to others. Now, don't get this theory confused with the incentive theory. The incentive theory also looks at intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, but this theory believes that behavior is largely driven by external rewards or punishments. Individuals are motivated to act due to extrinsic motivation. Actions that receive validation or external reward are more likely to be repeated. So essentially this theory is saying that we're all just motivated by treats. <sighs> Gotta love psychology. Simplifying human behavior down to Pavlov's dogs, one theory at a time. So we can see that both of these theories look at intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. But remember, self-determination theory focuses more on intrinsic rewards, highlighting that they have a larger impact on motivation, while the incentive theory states that extrinsic rewards have a larger impact. Now, if you do need more practice with the arousal theory, the yerkson dotson law, self-determination theory, or incentive theory, make sure you take the practice quiz that I created on these theories. You can find it located in my ultimate review packet. I also included breakdowns for each of the questions to make sure you're fully understanding these concepts. Just click the link in the description below after you're done with this video. All right, now I know we've talked a lot already about a bunch of different theories, but we still have two more to go. The first theory is the sensation seeking theory, which proposes that individuals have different needs for experiences, with each need impacting an individual's motivation to act. This theory is broken up into four different sensation seeking types. The first is experience seeking. This is the desire for new or unconventional experiences, like exploring new places or meeting different people. Next is thrill or adventure seeking, which is the drive to engage in physically risky activities, such as skydiving or extreme sports. Then there is disinhibition, which is the tendency to seek out social or recreational situations that involve relaxing
relaxing and having fun. For example, going to parties. Lastly, there is boredom susceptibility, which is an individual's tolerance for repetitive or routine experiences. This often influences how much an individual will seek new stimulation to avoid feeling bored. So we can see that a person's motivation to engage in different behaviors will depend on their level of sensation seeking. All right, so now we've made it to our last theory of motivation, which is Kurt Lewin's motivational conflict theory, which focuses on how people become Become motivated to act when confronted with a choice. This theory looks at three different types of conflicts that a person will experience in their life. The first is approach-approach conflict, which is when a person has to choose between two desirable or positive outcomes. For example, trying to decide between two appealing job offers. The next is avoidance-avoidance conflict, which is when a person must choose between two undesirable or negative outcomes. For example, having to decide between doing chores at home or doing doing your homework. Lastly, there is approach avoidance conflict, which is when one choice has both positive and negative aspects. For example, getting a job offer for a job that pays better, but the job is significantly farther away from your house, which would result in a much longer commute time. So we can see that when individuals have choices to pick between, they experience an internal conflict, resulting in them becoming motivated to resolve it. Generally, an individual will seek to pick a behavior and choice that minimizes their loss and reduces their internal tension. All right, you did it. Another topic review video is done. Now comes the time to practice. Go take the different practice quizzes in the ultimate review packet. All of them will help you study and master this material. I believe there's actually three different quizzes that connect back to this one video. As always, I'm Mr. Sin. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time online.